Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host Henry Smith, and on this television program we explore archaeological discoveries related to the reliability of the Bible. Now today on this program we're going to be talking about one individual who's recorded in the book of Acts, the proconsul Gallio. Uh, and the Apostle Paul stood before this gentleman when he was tried in Acts chapter 18. Now to help us understand the life of this particular individual mentioned in Scripture, joining us again is our staff member and friend, Brian Wendell from Canada. Brian's been doing a series of bioarchaeographies on his blog and recently researched and wrote about Gallio. Uh, Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth once again. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be back again, Henry. Yeah, I think we need to have like a third host. It's me, Scott Lancer, and you. You're on so often. Like, you know, we're going to have to start, you know, giving you a new title here. Uh, we're grateful for all always you Always happy to help. I'm always happy to help. All right. So uh, as we always say, we're going to jump right into the pool here. Uh, the first thing you can start with is telling us what is a bioarchaeography? Well, sh short story is it's a word I made up. Okay. Um, so if you if you look at a biography, right? A, bi a biography comes from the Greek words uh, bios, meaning life, and graphia, meaning writing, right? To to write about somebody's life, and then you have uh, archaeology, which comes from the the Greek word um, archaeos, meaning ancient, and uh, logia, which means um, to write about or to study. And so I thought, well, what if you put these two together? Uh, a bioarchaeography, basically using archaeology to write the story of somebody's life. And so uh, I've been exploring different people mentioned in Scripture and looking at the archaeology for their life and using that to, to really tell their story and, and fill in some of the background um, to who they are from the brief glimpses we often see in Scripture. I keep uh, I keep telling my wife that I need to invent something that will like make me <laughs> make me millions, but I don't think a bioarchaeography you could patent that, but I don't know how much you're going to make off of the term. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to I don't think I'm going to make very much on it, but yeah. we'll see if it catches on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, for us, it's going to catch on. So we're going to we're going to use that as a theme in over several uh, episodes that you and I do together uh, over the coming months. So let's jump in here. Talk about this proconsul in Acts chapter 18, Gallio. What do we, what do we know about this guy uh, from the scriptures? Sure, well, we only see him in Acts chapter 18, and, and it's there that an interesting thing happens. So, so the Apostle Paul came to, to Corinth, and he started preaching the gospel, and, and he did that the way that he normally did that. He went into the synagogue and preached, but the, the Jewish leaders were very hostile to his um, to the message to the gospel and and so he went next door to the house of a man named um, Titus Justus and 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 lots of people started putting their faith in the Lord Jesus in the city of Corinth, uh, including the synagogue leader himself, Crispus. And so needless to say, the Jewish leaders were not very happy about this. And so Luke's account in Acts chapter 18 continues this way. It says, but when Gallio was proconsul in of Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. Now, what's really interesting about this passage is we see a number of things in it. First of all, we see that there was a proconsul named Gallio, that he was a proconsul of, of Achaia, um, that particular region of in which Corinth was a city. And finally, I get the sense when I read this that Gallio was a very well spoken, incisive, no nonsense sort of a man. I mean, before Paul can even open his mouth to make his defense, Gallio just cuts him off and basically says, goes right to the heart of the issue, says there there has been no crime committed here. I refuse to try this case and basically kicks the Jews out of his tribunal. Yeah. Um, and and sets Paul free, and so and so when I was doing my bioarchaeography on Gallio, I thought, well, what 
we there are some famous archaeological discoveries which we'll talk about but i wanted to know is there any other evidence are there any other writings outside of scripture in which Gallio is described, and how do those line up with what we see in Scripture? And the short answer is, um, yes, there is. And so so I thought maybe today we just start with this little passage, because this is the only place we see Gallio in the New Testament. Uh, but it's a really important picture we see of him. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, your observations. It just so happens in the providence of God that I'm reading through Acts. And, I, you know, there's there's these patterns of some of these officials, these Gentile officials, very quickly understanding that this is not some kind of civil dispute. This isn't going to affect peace in the region or over my, under my authority. This is a religious dispute. And you're just trying to use me as a, as a weapon against this particular individual with whom you disagree, which in this case happens to be Paul. And so, you know, you, your observations about him are, are, I think, what others also observe. Like, this is... This has nothing to do with uh, the peace of the empire or jurisprudence in our area. You're just trying to use me as a weapon against this guy. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, keep in mind, too, right, that the, the Jewish leaders throughout the Roman Empire, particularly um, um, not just in, in Judea, they would have been very familiar with it, but, uh, but in other places, too, right, the, the Jewish people were um, sometimes were involved in revolts. And, and the Romans had to put that down, and uh, ultimately leading to, to, of course, the Great Revolt in, in um, ultimately 70 AD. And so, so all of this kind of goes into the background of these Roman officials who are often interacting with, um, with the Jewish leaders of the day. And I think, I think your point's right, Henry. I think that they recognized quite often um, when they were trying to be used um, to, uh, to do their dirty work, so to speak. Yeah, it it it's really it's really fascinating the way they they and they, you know they had a particular general view of of the Jews and the peculiarity of their religion, which they really didn't understand. Uh, no. So that was probably part of this too. Is like you know I'm not I'm not getting involved in this. So well, listen, Brian, I, we got about thirty seconds. Uh, you're going to talk in the next segment. Why don't you uh, set the stage just a little bit? Who's the first guy you're going to talk about in the next segment who talks about Gallio, and then we'll pick it up there. Sure. Well, there, there are a couple, but probably um, the most important, of course, would be Seneca. And the reason for that is that, um, is that Gallio was, was a fairly famous guy. He was related um, to Seneca. He was the brother of the philosopher of Seneca the Younger and the son of Seneca the Elder. Um, even though um, his name is Gallio, that's because he was adopted um, by by the Roman senator, senator Junius Gallio, so okay. he adopted his name. Excellent. So, yeah. All right. Well, we're going to pick up on that conversation in our next segment, and we'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and I'm here today with Brian Wendell, who's a pa uh, pastor and staff member uh, with ABR. Uh, Brian has been on the program many times talking about discoveries in archaeology, and today we're talking about just one individual, Gallio from uh, Acts chapter 18. Now, Brian, you, uh, in the last segment, introduced some uh, evidence outside the Bible about Gallio. Uh, you were talking about Seneca. Why don't you pick that up from here? Sure. Well, Gallio was Seneca's brother, and um, Seneca wrote about him and um, described him as a man who could not be swayed by flattery. He, he wrote of his character um, in, in one of his works. He said this about Gallio. 
One began by paying homage to his intellect, the greatest and worthiest of all, which had rather seek uh, consecrated to the service of heaven than wasted on weak human effort. He ran away from one who talked thus, or one who began to praise his thrift. He was so indifferent to money that he seemed to neither possess it nor condemn it. And he says he would cut off that the very first words, those who would try to flatter him. Um, and, the, and then the poet uh, Statius uh, describes him as being honey-tongued. And, and so what do we see in these descriptions of Gallio outside of the Bible? I would argue that we see the very same person that we see from Luke's description. We see someone who was well-spoken. We see someone who was an incisive man who who cuts people off <laughs> as if they're if they're starting to get into fluff or into something that that he he knows is not right and um, and so that's the same picture, isn't it, that we see of Gallio in um, in the Book of Acts. And so when I started to research um, who this man was and I started reading some of these contemporary descriptions of him, I was just struck with how accurate um, and how much uh, they align with what Luke wrote. And, um, and so it's just, it's just interesting to see that. Yeah, it's interesting, this uh, description, honey-tongued, to Paul, uh, that must have been like honey for him to just throw the whole thing out the door uh, before it even got started. And the incisiveness was against Paul's opponents. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really fascinating to see. You know, you, you're speaking into the eyewitness nature of the account of Luke writing this account, there, there's this eyewitness nature to it, and all the way down to the character of the man. It's quite extraordinary. These events were not recorded decades and centuries afterwards. No, and, and Luke says that when he, he wrote his works, right, Book of Luke and the Book of Acts together, they're a sequel, um, that he interviewed eyewitnesses. And I believe one of the, the obvious person who he interviewed about this was the Apostle Paul, who was right there, who had seen it all. Yeah. And, um, and that's why I think the, the descriptions are so accurate and so much ali in alignment with what we see outside of the Bible, too. All right, very good. Now let's turn our attention to the archaeology. I'm going to let you uh, jump right into that, Brian. Go ahead. Well, there are two discoveries, two archaeological discoveries primarily that, um, that relate to the story in the book of Acts and to Gallio in particular. The first is the Bema at Corinth. When Paul was brought uh, before the tribunal, were said. He was brought before the tribunal, and, and the Greek word there is the word bima. Uh, the bima is a judgment seat, and the judgment seat is is an elevated platform. You can see it in the picture here, uh, and, and it was from there that the city officials would address the public. And so the bima of Corinth was discovered in the market in the early 20th century. It was it was identified as the Bema because there was an, a Latin inscription there which describes it as such and says that the marble was provided by so-and-so. And, and so we know that this was the Bema, the tribunal of uh, Corinth. Now, um, you know this, Henry, sometimes when people go to the Holy Land, um, they are taken and shown places that um, people maybe think something happened, or or we know it didn't actually happen there, but it kind of represents a, an event that happened. I mean, the the classic one would be the um, the Garden Tomb. Um, most archaeologists know that tomb was 600 years old by the time Jesus came. That's not the tomb of Jesus, but it, it reminds us of what the tomb of Jesus might have been like in an ideal setting in a garden. With this here at Corinth, we have. We're pretty sure this is exactly where the Apostle Paul would have been tried. It's the tribunal. It's the Bema of Corinth. That's where Gallio would have been. So that's the first archaeological discovery. And the second um, is what's called the Delphi inscription. It's an inscription from Delphi, Greece, that actually names Gallio. It's an inscription, basically a letter from the Emperor Claudius, and in it he names my friend and proconsul L. Junius Gallio. And uh, it likely was attached at one point to the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, and, and it was a, a letter that, that Claudius wrote to the people there addressing their concern that they didn't have very many people, didn't have a, a big population. Uh, but it's really important for a number of reasons, which we'll talk about in the next segment. But first of all, it affirms exactly what Scripture says. It says that Gallio 
was the proconsul of that region right at the time that the Bible says he was. Yeah, it really, it really, you know, when you start tying it together, you put the description of his character, the kind of man he was, uh, the bema, the judgment seat, right in the right in the context. You'd have to be an eyewitness, and then of course, you know, this inscription about that the emperor actually knew this man and had a relationship with him. It's really, you know, it's really extraordinary. Now we see this more in the New Testament than the Old because the evidence is closer to us, but this is still stuff from two thousand years ago. Um, so it's extraordinary in the providence of God how these details have been preserved. It really is. And it's one of the things that I'm constantly reminding people who I talk to. And I do a lot of work with young people. And so one of the things that I'm often telling them is that, that these people we read about in the Bible, this is not like we're reading about Bilbo Baggins or some fictional character yeah. that has been made up. These are real people who really lived at a real place in time, exactly as Scripture says, and we can go back now and actually find archaeological evidence for them and written descriptions about them that show that the, the writings of Scripture are indeed accurate. Yeah, yeah, our, our, our young people, um, I mean, the Word of God is sufficient in terms of in and of itself, but uh, the way that we can utilize these evidences, any way to get past some of the barriers they've been taught, that these are mythologies or stories or, you know, fairy tales and all those kind of things that either directly or indirectly they've been taught, we want to, you know, blast that stuff away so that, you know, they can really hear the message that the scripture has to give, and that is, the, of course, of the message of eternal life. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, we can clear away the thorns for them with these tools. Well, Brian, thank you for all of that. We're going uh, to go to a break, and we'll be back in just a few moments. Please don't go away, and Brian will talk some more about Gallio in Acts chapter 18 and why this kind of evidence is important. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here today with Pastor Brian Wendell, who's a member of the ABR staff, and we're talking about uh, Gallio in Acts chapter 18, an individual recorded there we found in both history and archaeology outside the Bible. So, Brian, let's pick it up uh, a little bit further, uh, building on the significance of this individual who's recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, maybe you could talk about his importance as it relates to uh, the study of the New Testament in the book of Acts. Yeah, the Gallio inscription, um, which affirms what's written in the book of Acts, is, is one of the most important artifacts we have from the entire New Testament era in archaeology, and it, it is so for a particular reason. Um, it, we've said, we said in the last section that, that the, the Delphi inscription, or the Gallio inscription, is, uh, is a letter from the Emperor Claudius. The interesting thing is it's dated. The letter is dated. It says that um, Claudius had been acclaimed emperor for the 26th time. And so we know from history that that pinpoints it to 52 AD. Now, this is really important because um, we can start to build a chronology now. Dr. Andrew Steinman, in his uh, book from, from Abraham to Paul, notes that proconsuls usually took office on May the 1st of a year and served for one full year. And so if we start to look at it, some scholars have suggested um, that the way that it's written it implies that it was kind of from uh, from the particular part of a year. And so people have said this kind of seems to fit that that Gallio was proconsul in 51 to 52 AD, that one year period. Now, we start to put that together, right? Because in Acts 18 verse 11, we see that the Apostle Paul had been in Corinth for 18 months by the time this particular event 
happened. And, and so we start to now build a chronology. This means that that if he was brought before the proconsul in 51 AD, maybe um, he had been there then back 48, 49 AD. And, and we can start now building out from there, both forwards and backwards, a chronology of the Apostle Paul's ministry, but not just that, an, a chronology of the entire New Testament. So the Gallio inscription is hugely important for New Testament studies, particularly as it relates to chronology. Yeah, you know, Brian, I'm reminded of, uh, uh, there was an archaeologist a, quite a long time ago, William Ramsey, who came out of the 19th century, and at that time the skeptics and the German scholars were saying, no, Acts was written in the second century AD, it, was written, it wasn't written contemporaneously, and that, has been, that argument has been destroyed by the evidence that's been uncovered since then. But this still reminds me of the fact that there are some arguments out there today that make similar claims, and people in the church should not panic. They should trust in the Word of God and wait and see what archaeology brings. And we discovered in that instance that the scholars were completely and utterly wrong. They, they were wrong in their conclusions, and they were wrong because they didn't have a complete picture of the evidence. And that's important for us to remember um, in other areas. Now we have all this evidence that shows that all those theories fall apart, and they were, they were effectively a waste. Now, that's my little speech there, Brian, but I'm going, to let you, <laughs> I'm going to let you go back now. So I'm connecting to the next question, and that is, and the last question, and we're going to explore this until the end here. You know, we've talked many times, why, why is this so important? Uh, we keep reiterating why it's so important, but we want to continue to communicate why it's so important, especially if somebody's watching this program for the very first time. Yeah, and we, we often um, talk about a couple of things. First of all, we talk about how um, it's in, archaeology is important because it affirms details in Scripture. Um, we, uh, particularly those involved in, in the world of archaeology, we, we often note that um, that archaeology really helps provide a lot of the background to illuminate Scripture and, and help us uh, fill in some of the details um, that, we, that we don't have about the world that Paul lived in, for example, in Corinth, um, and about different people that are named in Scripture. Um, but what's really interesting about, about the book of Luke and the book of Acts is this. When Luke um, dedicated his work, uh, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he dedicated it um, to a man named Theophilus, and he tells us specifically why he wrote his books. He said this, he wrote so that Theophilus would know the certainty of the things you have been taught, Luke 1.4. Now, that's really interesting because what that says to me is that good historical research should lead to a certainty of faith. You know, it's interesting you mentioned William Ramsey, um, who was a man who lived um, a long time ago. But when he started doing his research in in the particular the area, particularly the area of Turkey, the area that Paul traveled in, um, he he was not a follower of Jesus. And, and it, when he started seeing how all of these all of these things in Scripture started to align with what he was seeing as he traveled, and was so different than um, the German higher critical thought that he'd been taught at the time. It it it, sh it blew his world apart, and he became. If you read some of, and I do encourage people to read some of his writings and some of the old uh, people's writings because there's just some great research and some great stuff in them. You know, we talked about how how I work with young people, and I remember a, a young lady who, after I spoke and was showing some of the history, she came up to me afterwards and she said, "I can't believe it's true. <laughs> the stories I heard in Sunday school are true." Yeah. And I said, "Yes, they are." And I think yeah. that's the one of the things that is so helpful about archaeology, and the findings of Gallio in specifically. Yeah, yeah. You know, that really moves my heart because because we want people. You know, they're. There's, as we wrap down the show here, Brian, uh, we, we read stories, we watch stories. You mentioned Bilbo Baggins, you know, uh, we read fictional stories. But uh, there's a true story that's been woven in history. It's the story of the gospel unfolding in the Bible. And uh, we're, uh, we're just so thankful to God that uh, he's allowed these discoveries to sort of be woven into our knowledge of the scriptures. So, Brian, thank you for coming on the show today. As always, you're awesome, and you edify the saints and hopefully challenge those who are watching who are seeking truth. 
Well, thanks so much for having me, Henry. It's just it's just a great opportunity, and my faith's been built through all of this too, so it's great to pass that on. Yes, thank you very much. Well, friends, we're reminded of the reliability of the Bible, and of course, in, the, in that claim that the Bible is reliable, that we can trust it through archaeology, is the message of the Bible, and that is that we're sinners alienated from a holy God, but we can be reconciled through His Son, through His death and resurrection. And we hope that you will accept and embrace this glorious truth today. Thank you for joining us.